Today we are continuing the study of Matthew chapter 13 that we began last week, Jesus' parable about the sower. And we'll also be talking about the harvest. I couldn't give you my talking head this time because I've had some serious computer issues, so this will be a simple voiceover. We're going to be looking at the sower and the harvest through the eyes of Vincent van Gogh. Van Gogh, who treated the theme of the sower and the harvest countless times in his work. Perhaps a brief biographical sketch of Vincent is in order before we begin. Vincent was born into a deeply religious Dutch family. His father and grandfather were ministers in the Dutch Reformed Church. During his late teens and early 20s, Vincent worked as an art dealer in the Netherlands, in London, and finally in Paris, where he joined his brother Theo, who was also an art dealer. But Vincent, unlike Theo, tended to be argumentative and very opinionated, which aren't qualities that make for a great salesman. So at age 23, he felt that his true calling was to serve God in the church, as his forebears had done. He received training in theology and even did what might be called missionary work amongst the poorest of the poor in Belgium, living and preaching amongst the workers in the coal mines. Often he went without food, he gave his clothing away to the needy, and he might be found sleeping rough outside. The miners didn't really know what to make of this strange man. And the church elders looked askance at his unorthodox, radical behavior. He was not allowed to continue preaching. He finally turned to art, and thanks to his brother Theo's support, was able to obtain art lessons and to acquire art supplies. Although he abandoned organized religion, he never lost his love of God and his sense of a sacred calling. But now he wanted to bring glory to God through his art, through communicating the beauty he felt all around him. In one of his many letters, he wrote, one cannot do better than hold on to the thought of God through everything, under all circumstances, at all places, at all times. It is good to continue believing that everything is more miraculous than one can comprehend for this is truth. You sense this drive to see the miraculous, the hand of God, in his images of the natural world and the change of the seasons, always infusing his depiction of nature with a fierce energy, with unconventional energetic brushstrokes and the interplay of bright contrasting colors. And his sympathies were always with the common man, the farmer or hired hand, who worked hard in the fields to gain a living. As we mentioned last week, early on, he tried to imitate the figure of the sower, as painted by Jean-Francois Millet, in order to improve his drawing technique. And toward the end of his life, when he was in an asylum because of a complete mental breakdown, he turned again to copying the figures of Millet as you can see in these side-by-side -side comparisons. First of all, of course, the sower, but also a young man harvesting, a woman gathering in the sheaves, as well as a young man bundling the harvested grain, and here a man using a, a scythe to cut the wheat. He resorted to copying these figures of Millet because for a period of time he was not allowed to go outside by himself, as no one knew what he would do. He had already cut off his ear after an argument with fellow artist Paul Gauguin, and nobody wanted to see him commit more violence against himself or anybody else. While he was confined to the asylum, he was allowed to have drawing material as well as prints of the paintings by Millet that he loved so much. Copying them was a sort of therapy, and it wasn't long before he was once again allowed to go outside 
and given permission to resume painting in the open air. This phenomenon of painting en plein air, or in the open air, was a relatively new phenomenon. The so-called Impressionists, following Monet's example, had begun to do this. And this had only become possible thanks to a man by the name of John Gough Rand. He was the first to develop a way to keep paint fresh in a sealed tube. This made it possible to transport paint easily outside, where the artist could squeeze it out as he needed it, while the rest remained preserved in the tube. And there was another technological breakthrough that made the kind of painting Vincent did possible. That was the invention of synthetic pigments. Previously, painters laboriously mixed naturally occurring pigments that had been ground and reduced to powder form and then suspended in an oil base, in the case of oil painting, or water, perhaps with another mixture, if the painting was to be in watercolors. These new pigments were pre-mixed and put into portable tubes, and the new pigments offered a much greater range of colors than the classical palette. You can see that the colors available to the Impressionist painter on the right, and subsequently to Vincent, offered both a broader range of color and a much brighter, more vivid palette. Without the metal tubes and the synthetic pigments, the painting of Vincent would have been very different indeed. For the first time, painters were able to capture all the colors of the natural world, and the colors were saturated, opaque, dense, which perfectly suited Vincent's style of painting, which was intensely focused on color. That brings us to yet another rather technical aspect of painting that is absolutely critical for the understanding of Vincent's work and the art of virtually all painters from that time on. A scientist by the name of Chevreul devised a color diagram, and Vincent was well aware of what the diagram illustrates. The points of the central triangle, where I have placed the arrows, show us the primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. Opposite each of the primaries is that color's complementary color, which is made by mixing the two other primaries. So the complementary of red is the mixture of blue and yellow, which is green. The complementary of blue is a mixture of yellow and red, which is orange, and the complementary of yellow is a mixture of blue and red, which is purple. Here they are, juxtaposed with each other. What Chevreul had noticed and what Vincent learned was what came to be called the law of simultaneous contrast. If you take a primary in its purest state and juxtapose it with its complementary in its purest state, the eye has difficulty focusing on the two colors at the same time. They develop an energy, a vibration. They almost seem to throb. Vincent would make abundant use of this in his painting. It was his way of conveying the force of God, of life, coursing through nature and humanity. One last bit of information before we go on to look at Vincent's paintings of the sower and the harvest. Like the Impressionists before him, Vincent had fallen in love with all things Japanese, particularly the colorful, mass-produced, inexpensive block prints that were suddenly flooding into Europe from Japan. These were called ukiyo-e prints. Japan had been closed off from the Western world for 200 years until 1854, when a treaty was passed that ended the official Japanese policy of seclusion and opened up trade between Japan and Europe. You will notice that the light in these prints is uniform. There is no use of chiaroscuro 
or aerial or linear perspective, none of the elements that we've studied so far. And therefore, they appear rather flat and feature large blocks of uniform color. There's no attempt to create the illusion of depth or the contours, say, of a body with foreshortening and shading. Vincent and his brother Theo got involved in the buying and selling and collecting of these prints. And you will see how Vincent began to be inspired by them. Now we're ready to take a look at some of Vincent's work. In a letter, he writes excitedly to his brother Theo in June of 1888 that he is working on a sewer. His words are there on the right. He imagines a great field that is all violet, the sky and sun very yellow. He's struggling with it and says it's a hard subject to treat. At this time, he has moved to the south of France, a town called Arles, to seek the sun and the bright colors that he seldom saw in Paris and almost never in his native Holland. For some reason, he thought the south of France would be like Japan. That was his inspiration for going there in the hopes of founding an artist's colony. The very next day, he writes again, talking about the picture of a sower that he is planning. He tells Theo he hopes his sower will be a masterpiece that would speak a symbolic language through color alone, which would make it completely modern. He asks his brother rhetorically, could the sower be painted in color? contrasting yellow and violet together, for example. Yes or no? Then he gets to work drafting drawings of his plan because he found it hard going. The subject was very challenging, and he really wanted this to come out right. And this is the result. Instead of yellow and violet, Vincent chose the complementaries blue and orange, as you can see from the flecks of orange sprinkled through the field of blue, and the almost orange uncut field in the distance contrasting with the field of blue. And my goodness, what a sun. It is the sun that draws the viewer magnetically in once he or she has embarked on the yellow path that opens in the blue field before us. For Vincent, the sun represented God, the source of love and life. He recreates the cycle of life here. The sower sows new wheat, while the mature wheat stands tall in the background. It will soon be harvested, which will mean death, just as the setting sun might symbolize death. But there will be rebirth. The sun will rise again, and the buried seeds will grow into a new crop. As Jesus said, a grain of wheat must fall to the ground and die in order that new life can come into being. Or, as Vincent said, one begins to see more clearly that life is a kind of sowing, and the harvest is not yet here. He would return to this theme again and again. Vincent's next image of the sower draws its inspiration from the Japanese ukiyo-e prints, and in particular, this one by Hiroshige of the Flowering Plum Orchard. Vincent had actually done his own take on this print because he wanted to experiment with the cropped composition, cutting off the tree that you see in the foreground and used the large, flat blocks of color with strong outlines, with no shading to indicate the roundness of tree trunks. For Vincent, it was color for color's sake, vivid and bold. He didn't care whether it resembled natural color or shading at all. Excitedly, he tells his brother Theo about his latest canvas. Here is a sketch of my latest painting. Again, a sower. Huge yellow disc as the sun. Sky, green, yellow, and pink clouds. 
violet earth, the sower and the tree, Prussian blue. And here it is, the sower at sunset, the huge yellow disk of the sun, the violet fields as a muted complementary color, the green sky with complementary pinkish red clouds. Vincent liked this so much that he repeated it in different colors. Here is a similar version with the green sky and pink clouds, but the fields are now a patchwork of very bright blue and violet. This happens to be my personal favorite. The lone dark figure of a single anonymous man silhouetted against the setting sun is so powerful and it's reminiscent of Millet. And the cropped tree in the foreground just works so well as a diagonal dividing the image, but also giving the composition more energy and drama. Again, we see Vincent using the complementaries of purple and yellow, red and green, and the color is deeply saturated. The sun almost appears to form a halo behind the sower's head. And I think this image was indeed a holy one for Vincent. I love what he wrote in 1889. What the germinating force is to a grain of wheat, love is in us. But if there is sowing, there must also be reaping the harvest. And Vincent loved that too. While he was in Arles in the south of France, hoping to found an artist colony, he painted a landscape that he considered one of his most successful paintings. He called it the harvest at La Croix, which was just outside of Arles. You can see where it is marked on the map. This is a particularly meticulous study in preparation for the painting. Here is a sketch that begins to map out areas and colors, particularly where he wanted bright white to appear on the sides of the buildings, where he wanted green foliage to be placed, and where the complementary violet should appear against the predominant yellow, as you see in the fence, the cart, and the mountains and fields in the distance. And here is the finished product. You can feel the dryness and heat of a summer's day in the bright yellows and greens coupled with an azure sky. And again, it has a certain flatness like a Japanese print because he has not tried to create the illusion of distance through linear or aerial perspective. His agitated brushwork in the foreground, that is the stippling of the leaves, the fence, the grain going in different directions, this all gives energy and movement to the foreground. But the long, smooth bands of color in the background make for a much greater feeling of calm on a long, hot summer's day. It's a wonderful display of all his characteristic techniques. I'll conclude with a few more images of the wheat fields and the harvest that Vincent painted in the last two years of his life. First, from Arles, during a particularly happy and productive period in his life, before he had the mental breakdown. Here you see the harvest, and I've circled the harvester here because he's perhaps harder to see. The following year, he wrote to his sister, aren't we who live on bread to a considerable extent like wheat? At least, aren't we forced to submit to growing like a plant and to being reaped when we are ripe, like the same wheat? His thoughts often turn to the harvest. Here is a fabulous painting from 1889 with the orange mounds of grain rising up just as do the bright blue mountains in the background under the rolling waves of a stippled sky and a radiant setting sun, the energy of his brush strokes moving the eye around and through the canvas. 
and the images of the harvest and the reaper accumulate. As he wrote his brother Theo about this painting, for I see in this reaper a vague figure toiling away for all he's worth in the midst of the heat to finish his task. I see in him the image of death in the sense that humanity might be the wheat he is reaping. So it is, if you like, the opposite of the sower, which I tried to do before. But there's no sadness in this death. This one takes place in broad daylight, with a sun flooding everything with light of pure gold. And the sun, as we have noted before, symbolized God to Vincent, the source of all love and life. Vincent sensed that his mental state was growing more agitated, and he felt himself again on the verge of a breakdown. Theo helped him move closer to him in Paris, to Auvers, a village not far from the capital. Here again, he paints the reaper in the same fields where he would take his own life in a few short months. And so we say goodbye to Vincent and to Jesus's parables of the sower and the harvest. Next week, we will return to the Old Testament and a look at Jacob wrestling with an angel. I hope to see you then.